All right, let's get this started. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to our What's New in Keyshot 10 webinar. My name is Kareem Merchant. I'm a creative specialist here at Luxion. And in today's webinar, I'll be walking you through all the new incredible features introduced in our latest version of Keyshot, as well as a few incredibly helpful improvements to existing features. Before we get started, I just wanted to put up a slide here uh, with some of our resources and contact info, which Derek mentioned. Uh, if you have any questions now or in the future, feel free to reach out to myself at kareem at luxion.com uh, or send questions and inquiries to our general info, support, and sales emails, which can be found on this slide as well, and on our website, www.keyshot.com. If you're interested in staying up to date with the latest news, releases, and events here at Luxion, you can find us through social on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And we also have a great forum where you can post questions and show off samples of your work to get feedback from the Keyshot community. I also wanted to give a quick plug to our Keyshot 3D YouTube channel. If you have not visited yet, I highly recommend that you do so. Uh, it's a great resource for Keyshot quick tips, tutorials on all our latest features, and it's, con it's consistently updated with new content created right here at Luxion. Uh, also available on our YouTube is our 12-part Keyshot Essential series that'll take you all the way from initial install to final render and covers all the aspects of the process in between. So if you're relatively new to Keyshot or just getting started, that's a fantastic resource to dive into. So definitely check that out. With that said, let's take a look at some of the new features and improvements we're going to cover in today's What's New webinar. RealCloth is back on our list in Keyshot 10, bringing with it huge improvements to both appearance and processing. We'll also be talking about the new animation improvements that are designed to extend Keyshot's animating capabilities and make them easier than ever to use. I'll cover some great new updates to our physical lighting tools, as well as the move tool, and finish up covering Keyshot 10's rendering improvements, smart exports, and a couple general improvements while working in Keyshot. And of course, we'll run a few demos at the end to give everyone a closer look at how some of these features work. Oh, I also almost forgot to mention that we have a few of our Luxion team members monitoring the Q&A chat. So if you have questions, feel free to post them there. All right, first up, Real Cloth. Still one of my favorite features in the last two versions of Keyshot. And this year, it is absolutely better than ever. RealCloth 2.0 offers a series of new UI updates and processing updates that allow for better control over RealCloth applications, as well as increased fiber level detail. Uh, these UI updates include a new interface for weave presets and pattern editing, as well as display options to switch between one-sided, two-sided, and 3D ply geometry, which I'll cover more in depth momentarily. And in Keyshot 10, you can also add custom warp and weft fiber materials easily, using the material graph. So what makes RealCloth 2.0 better than traditional RealCloth in Keyshot 9? Well, the big difference is in the ability to create 3D ply geometry. Uh, this is important because although Keyshot 9's RealCloth represented a large leap in cloth material replication, it did not hold up entirely at, at near to macro camera ranges. Uh, the images on the right of this slide represent the difference between a single-sided ply application, which is how RealCloth functioned in Keyshot 9, and a 3D ply application, which is possible in Keyshot 10. Uh, immediately, you'll notice that at macro ranges, single-sided ply tends to appear flatter, and uh, it lacks the depth of typical woven material, unlike the results of the 3D ply geometry at the bottom here. Another thing to note is that the usage of 3D ply not only creates a more realistic physical representation of the individual threads, but it also creates uh, a surface that is more permeable to light, uh, substantially increasing its believability as a woven material. And we can actually see this illustrated on the image in the previous slide, uh, where you can see a, a sample of a, a backlit 3D ply application uh, notice how the light passes through the gaps between the threads, as well as how it reacts in areas where the cloth is bunched up or folded over. Um, this model was actually provided to us by Magnus Skogsfjord, and it does an awesome job at illustrating how real cloth works. And if I'm not mistaken, this scene is also going to be available in Keyshot 10's welcome window as a demo scene. So definitely check that out if you'd like to do some experimenting of your own. And uh, quickly before I move on to the next slide, 3D ply geometry also provides 360 degree normals, 
uh, for more realistic flyaway applications. So that kind of helps boost its, its realism there as well. Another great update to real cloth is custom warp and weft colors. Using the material graph, you can now easily apply custom surface materials to cloth applications while still maintaining the real cloth geometry. Uh, this makes it incredibly easy to create materials such as metal or plastic meshes for a number of different product applications. And you can see in the image on the right, a close up of a, a metal mesh material that I created, as well as a screenshot of that same materials material graph on the bottom here. Super easy, very quick to do, looks great. Uh, I'll definitely take a minute or two to show you guys this workflow during the demo portion at the end as well. All right, so real cloth is fun, but so is animating. And in Keyshot 10, we've implemented a brand new keyframe animation workflow, as well as introduced a few new animation types, including some really fun sun and sky animations. A huge addition to Keyshot 10's animating capabilities comes in the form of keyframe animation. Keyframe animation allows you to control your geometry's movement with sequences of keyframes, which provides significantly better control when animating, and it also allows you to eat more easily create more complex visuals. And if you're already familiar with using keyframes in other programs, Keyshot 10's keyframe animation should be pretty easy and, and comfortable to jump into. So sun and, day arc, sun and Sky Day Arc animation, this is another great animation update to Keyshot. Uh, this new addition allows you to create animations where the environment's daytime is animated, uh, essentially simulating the passage of time over a determined period. It's also important to note that this animation works specifically with sun and sky environments, so you would need to either apply one to your scene from the environments tab or set your background as sun and sky in the HDRI editor to use this specific animation. And on this page, I have a little example using a few screenshots from the sun and sky day arc animation. You can see here that the animation simulates time passing from sunrise to sunset. And not only does it cause a shift in shadow location, but it also causes a shift in color temperature as well. Uh, I think this is gonna be a, an awesome tool for architectural and vehicle renderings, and it will definitely help add a level of realism to many of your product applications as well. Also very useful is the new environment rotation animation. This animation is pretty straightforward. It allows you to apply a rotation animation to any environment you've applied or created. So far, we've used this animation a few times here at Luxion for some sample animations. Uh, one was for a vehicle animation, which you can find on our keyshot.com what's new page. And the other was used to show off a packaging design. And if I'm not mistaken, Brooke will show you that one at the end here. Uh, it definitely produced some really quick eye-catching animations, and it was significantly easier and faster to render out than previous methods used to create similar results. Highly recommend giving that one a try if you're looking for a quick way to create some interesting visuals. All right, and last on our list for the animation updates is the addition of a new camera twist animation. This one allows you to add an animation to your camera twist parameter, and it's a great way to quickly add some dynamic movement to your animation scenes. Uh, Keyshot 10's animation overhaul definitely has some great new features and updates that I, I think you guys are going to love. And uh, if you stick around for our demo portion, another one of our creative specialists, Brooke Harrington, is going to give you a more in-depth look at some of these awesome animation updates as well. So definitely stay tuned for that. But before then, we still have a few more useful updates, uh, like our improvements to physical lighting and light controls. Uh, Keyshot 10 has bought, brought a brand new one-step workflow for quickly adding physical lights to your scenes, as well as the addition of light gizmos, which provide easy-to-use visual editing tools right in the real-time view. Uh, I'll go over these updates in the demo section as well, but you can see from the image on the right what a spotlight light gizmo would look like. The spotlight definitely has the most comprehensive light gizmo of all the physical lights, uh, and it allows you to, to make quick adjustments to parameters like fall off and beam angle. The Move tool has also received some updates. Uh, in previous versions of Keyshot, the Move tool did not accurately track your mouse's movements, which typically led to clicking and dragging multiple times to move a part into place. Uh, this was particularly noticeable when trying to move parts at steep camera angles. Uh, the Move tool window UI has also had some changes. Uh, familiar checkboxes for translate, rotate, and scale are now replaced by icons and the access pivot point and snap two settings can now be found in the advanced accordion at the bottom of the window, which you can see right there. 
Uh, there's also a new position accordion that has the same parameters as the position sub tab located on the project panel. And any adjustments you make to one will be reflected in the other. And you can see that right about there. And so you can see in that image with, with the what the window would look like with both accordions open. They come completely closed, so it's nice and clean. Uh, something else to note about the new move tool window is that it's no longer confined to the real-time view. You can move it outside in any position that's convenient and you can also be docked in uh, all the four corners of the real-time view. Next, we have the addition of solo mode. Very straightforward. Solo mode allows you to work on one or more parts individually without disrupting the hierarchy of any other hidden parts. Uh, this doesn't take away from any existing workflows, but it supplements and improves upon the what exists in previous versions. Definitely a great tool, and I've used it quite often in recent weeks. So definitely play around with that if you want to speed up your workflows. Uh, tune shaders outline behavior has also been improved. The goal here was to create a tune shader that was more consistent with traditional line drawing weights. You can see on the right here an example of a tune shader material being used in Keyshot 10, which is at the top, versus the same tune shader rendered in Key, or excuse me, Keyshot 9, which is at the top, versus the same tune sh shader rendered in Keyshot 10 at the bottom. There's a big difference between the two, and it's clear that the Keyshot 10 rendering on the bottom demonstrates a more realistic representation of you know, actual line drawing art. All right, now this is an awesome improvement if you work with clear or translucent materials often. Keyshot 10's updates to caustic performance increase the speed at which caustics converge on both CPU and GPU, but most noticeably on GPU. And it also makes convergence speed less dependent on the overall size of your scene, so larger scenes will typically suss themselves out a lot faster. Uh, definitely useful for getting those caustics to pop. Uh, big improvement. And uh, let's actually go ahead and look at some examples of this in use. So this one, this is one of our sample scenes that can be found on the Keyshot website. Uh, both images were rendered at the same sample count in CPU mode using caustics with a rough dielectric material. Uh, you'll notice improvements to the way the material reacts to light passing through. And you can also see how the caustics are generally improved in both the liquid held inside and the shadow behind it. So you can kind of see how the light's passing through that liquid right there. And this shadow with the caustics passing through seems to be significantly more realistic than this, where we have a lot of that washed out and the detail of the surface is kind of gone. So big improvement, big improvement. Took a little bit longer to render, but for what you're getting, it's, it's pretty spectacular. This is another example from one of our demo scenes using GPU mode instead of CPU mode. Uh, the improvement in caustics through the car's windshield is extremely apparent. Uh, and with both rendered at 128 samples, you can see that the Keyshot 10 rendering is by far the clear winner. Uh, definitely convenient for speeding up scenes with heavy caustics, like the night and day difference between the two of them. So very, very awesome. All right. Uh, among our rendering improvements, we've added a Firefly removal tool, which can be found under our denoise settings in the image tab. This one does an incredible job of getting rid of those hot spots and fireflies that you just can't seem to get rid of no matter how hard you try. Uh, something to note with this feature is that a little does go a long way, much like denoise itself. If you use too much of the firefly removal effect, it tends to wash highlights out and you end up losing image detail and depth. Uh, so definitely use it sparingly to start with and know that some of that detail will come back as the image reses up. And just to, to give you an idea of what the Firefly removal tool can do, here we have an image with lots of glass and reflections. You can see that it's pretty noisy uh, with a fair amount of hotspots and fireflies. I've only rendered this at 10 samples, just a quick rendering. And here is that same scene with 10 samples, but with Firefly filter applied at 0.65. You can see there's a clear difference in noise and fireflies between the two. Uh, but you'll also notice that some of the ridge detail in the glasses is a bit more washed out and flatter looking. Again, letting the image res up a bit will help bring out some of that detail, uh, but this is just a super quick 10 sample render to show you guys just how much of an effect the filter can have on a scene. And I'll just jump between those two real quick so you get a, a little idea what's going on there. Very useful. I've been using this one a lot recently. Smart exports. All right, so smart exports are awesome. 
Uh, basically, they refer to a group of export file types in Keyshot 10 that use UV unwrapping and baking to prep your scenes for AR, mobile, and 3D print workflows. Uh, they include two new export file types, which are USDZ and 3MF, and uh, include updates to existing GLB GLTF format exporter. Uh, all these exporters can be easily found in the export flyout menu under file. So let's, uh, let's take a look at these a little bit closely individually. Uh, USDZ is essentially a zipped version of a USD file. It contains mesh, binary, and texture data for use in AR applications and can make visualizing objects in augmented reality extremely easy. If you're an Apple user uh, using a device with iOS 12 and above, you should be able to easily preview your USDZ files using Apple's uh, built-in AR Quick Look. Unfortunately, Android devices currently have no native support, but you can always experiment with third-party viewers. As I mentioned previously, uh, GLB GLTF is not a new format to Keyshot. However, in Keyshot 10, this smart export has been updated to provide better UV unwrapping, baking, and full support for physically based rendering, also known as PBR. Uh, I've exported a few of these file types lately uh, while I was experimenting with online viewing using sites like Sketchfab. Uh, very useful. And finally, the last of the smart up export updates is the addition of 3MF format, which is definitely one of my favorite updates because I absolutely love rapid prototyping. Also known as 3D manufacturing format, the intent of 3MF was to create a platform where both 3D model and data such as dimensions, colors, textures, materials, and mesh information could be exported and saved, creating a better alternative to, to SDL format, which has been around forever. Um, if, you, if you're looking to, to make prototyping significantly easier and significantly faster, this is definitely the export format you're going to want to start working with. Uh, we've recently been experimenting with full color printing using 3MF files on our in-house J55 printer from Stratasys, and it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing what kind of results we've been able to achieve straight out of Keyshot. No Photoshop, no multiple programs, straight out of Keyshot 3MF into printing. It's awesome. And the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, before our demos here uh, was two general improvements to Keyshot 10. Uh, first, we have locked camera mapping, which opens up the possibilities for placing textures and labels. Uh, with this new feature, you can project an image onto your geometry from a fixed camera position. This allows for more accurate mapping if your goal is to map a texture in the same position as a real-world product. This is particularly useful for architectural visualizations. If you, uh, if you have like a, a photograph of a house, you can recreate the camera position in Keyshot. Then with this feature, you can easily project that image onto your geometry. Very, very useful. And the second general improvement I wanted to cover was our newly added flip normals tool, which you can actually see in the image on the right. Uh, this tool allows you to automatically or manually reverse the direction of the normals on an object by selecting its, surf, uh, its, its faces. And you can find the flip normals tool located under tools on the ribbon above the real time view. And uh, I will show you how to use that feature in just a moment here. All right, so it's demo time. I am going to run through a couple demos, some real cloth, physical lights, light gizmos, the move tool, and the flip normals. And then I'm actually going to pass it over to Brooke, one of our other creative specialists, who's going to go over our animation overhaul improvements. So let's go ahead and jump into real cloth. All right, so real cloth. Uh, like I said, is one of my favorite uh, features in Keyshot as someone who's done a fair amount of soft goods products and even pro hard goods that that incorporate some sort of, of cloth material or cloth finish this is an invaluable tool right now what you're seeing is uh that same that same scene from magnus we have 3d ply enabled so you can get an idea of what that looks like you can see that there's little white dots in between the actual threads that's the light passing through you can see how it reacts to curves in the actual fabric and where fabric is bunched over. Very realistic, uh, a big step up, in my opinion, from, from uh, single ply and, and two-sided ply. But let's, let's take a look at that material 
and uh, let's see what those different ones look like. So under display, when you're in your property sub tab is where you're gonna be able to switch between single-sided, two-sided and 3D ply. As usual, if you hover over of them, they'll give you a quick tip, uh, which kind of gives you a little bit of background information on what each of those does. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over single-sided because that's kind of what we're used to in Keyshot 9, give you an idea of what that looks like. Yeah, so now, now we're in single-sided ply. Um, if you saw a second ago, uh, there was a lot of light coming through individual threads throughout this, this uh, actual material here. And that really lent to uh, creating a more believable material. Uh, you can still see the flyaways that exist. You can still see uh, some light cascading. It does look very realistic, uh, but the 3D ply just gives it a little bit of an edge. And uh, Derek actually used this as a description recently. Basically, think about single-sided ply as a piece of paper where cloth was attached to one side, and you're looking at that one side. And you can actually, let me go into free camera, you can kind of see that going on right here, where one side has uh, the flyaways attached to it versus one side does not. So that's that's basically one-sided ply. You, your normals are only coming off in one direction. Uh, in Keyshot 9, you could flip normals depending on, on what you were working with and, and what you were trying to accomplish. Uh, but in, in Keyshot 10, you can do two-sided ply now. I'll go ahead and update that and, and you'll see the difference between one-sided and two-sided. Okay, so yeah, this is, this is two-sided ply. Uh, basically, you're getting that same effect instead of just on one side, you're now having it on two side apply. And this is like having a piece of cloth glued on one side of a piece of paper with another piece of cloth sandwiching it on the other side. So light is still not quite passing through. Uh, you're not getting that same realistic behavior that you would get out of 3D ply, but both single ply and two sided ply are a great way to create cloth like surfaces while still kind of uh, uh, reducing the computing power required to, to, to make your scenes work, especially if you're doing animations. Um, um, if you don't have a computer that's like really powerful, it's going to benefit you to work with single-sided or two-sided ply uh, because it'll require a lot less calculations. Uh, I love using 3D ply at this point. I think it's incredible. And uh, let's actually take a close look at the 3D ply strands versus uh, the single-sided or the two-sided so you can get an idea of the big difference there. So let's take a peek at it close up. I'm sorry, I'm not on our studio computer today. So uh, my computer's a little bit slower, um, but maybe if we do performance mode. Okay, so there you go. You can get an idea. It's a, it's a little dark, but you can see the individual strands actually look like, like threaded yarn. Uh, they're actually weaving inside each other. There's curvature to them. Uh, they feel very realistic. And you can even see here zoomed in that you're getting light peeking through. So that's that's really what kind of gives it this, this more realistic appearance. And you can see here in the background too, where there's, there's visibility through the entire material. Um, we're literally looking at digital cloth at this point. It's, it's really an awesome feature. And let me, let me look back at uh, two-sided versus single-sided, so you can get an idea of the difference of, of what that looks like. All right, so that should have updated by now. Um, you can see, like, up, up close at macro views, uh, it's not quite as realistic as 3D ply, um, but, you know, when you zoom out, you're, you're getting a very realistic-looking cloth. Uh, and if you use transparency, that kind of helps increase how believable it is when you're using single-sided and two-sided. But again, that three-dimensionality of threads doesn't exist with those two, only 3D ply. And, and that's also uh, kind of leading us into that mesh workflow that I'm talking about, because you're going to need to use 3D ply to use the new mesh workflow. It won't work for single-sided or two-sided. So let's jump into that, and I will show you how to make a metal mesh. Um, so I have a multi-material right here set up with a metal mesh already applied, just so I can kind of introduce you to it. Um, the scene's lighting isn't perfect. Let me see if changing the environment helps a little bit. Okay, yeah. So this is a simple metal mesh I created using the 3D ply geometry. Uh, to do this, you're gonna have to use the uh, material graph. So it is something that 
Keyshot Pro users are gonna are gonna have to take advantage of. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and click that material and open the material graph to show you what's going on here. So you can ignore this top material because that is our actual real cloth. And down here is what we're working with for our, our mesh material. Essentially, to create this, what I've done is I've applied a real cloth and I started working from a, a, a real cloth, in this case, the, the plain weave mesh. And I removed the real cloth element to it from the surface and I applied it to geometry. I then used a metal material from the library and I applied that to the surface and was able to adjust the color uh, to, to more accurately reflect the type of metal that I, I wanted to, to use. And I'm gonna see if I can do this for you guys real quick by, by making another one. So I started off with real cloth and I used a plain weave mesh. I'm gonna use the white one here and drop it into my multi-material. And so this is what we're working with at this point. Now, again, something to uh, uh, remember is that you need to use 3D ply. So right now we're connected to the surface. I'm gonna go ahead and not use 3D ply just to show you what'll happen. Um, throw it in a geometry, you kind of get this uh, blue cross hatched UV kind of uh, uh, material that appears on your, your screen. And then I'm gonna go ahead and grab a metal material, uh, metal polished white, and I'm gonna plug it into my surface. So without 3D ply, this should just look like a metal material applied to the top. So if you're struggling, this is the issue that you're having right here. You have to go into your real cloth and you need to select 3D ply geometry. And when that decides to update, you should have a metal mesh at the same scale that your real cloth is set to. It's that easy, much simpler than, than previous workflows for creating metal meshes. So, you know, whether, whether it's a, a product that has a metal mesh, whether it's a vehicle grill, um, plastic mesh materials for, for some sort of basketry or something, this is a incredibly quick uh, solution to creating that kind of material. Awesome workflow. Uh, I think it's a lot easier than Keyshot 9. So if that's what you're trying to do, this is the way to go about it. All right, so that's that's a real cloth. Let's let's look at some physical lights and light gizmos. Let's introduce you to that. All right, so a little game controller I put together. Um, and in this scene, let me um. Okay, so in this scene, we have a couple different physical lights going on here. Um, I'm working mainly with the spotlight, and we also have a uh, point light that's illuminating the bottom of the game controller. So basically what you're seeing right now is the light gizmo. Uh, physical lights have been updated so that the existing wireframes that existed for each of them are now replaced by these gizmos. Um, and what's improved as well is the ability to add physical lights. So in previous versions, you'd you know grab a model, uh, some geometry, whatever you were using, sphere or cube, or you'd create your own geometry, and then you'd apply a lit material onto that. So now you don't need to worry about that anymore. You just go up to the edit menu, and there's a new add light menu where you can pick from four different physical lights. Super easy. You can also use the hotkey shift one through four to grab whatever you want. Um, all of these have light gizmos except for area light, uh, with spotlight being the most comprehensive. Uh, both IES and point light, the only parameter you're going to be able to adjust inside of uh, uh, the real-time view is the radius of the, the actual light. Versus spotlight, you can adjust uh, beam angle and fall off, which is what you're seeing over here. So I'm going to, I'm going to start by, actually, you know what, let's, let's jump, let's drop a, an IES light so you can see what that looks like. Uh, so here's your wireframe. Your wireframe is going to be dependent on, on objects in your scene and the scale of everything. Uh, you can't interact with that wireframe, but it gives you an idea of the shape of the light. And then this little uh, purple point in the center, if you drag that, you can change the radius uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to show that on the spotlight just because it's a little bit better set up right now. So in the center here at the top, this functions the exact same way that the rest of the physical lights work. If you grab that little purple point in the center, you can just grab it and pull it and Anywhere, any size you're looking for radius, you can do that straight from the real-time view, makes it significantly faster to use. You also have a light blue handle that is traveling downwards. Typically when you pull in a, a spotlight, it's gonna look something more like this. Um, this is super useful when you're looking at how 
your light is going to project onto a surface or an object. Uh, by pulling that down, you're able to kind of set that on a surface and see what the, the, the uh, diameter is going to look like when it hits the ground or, or what objects are getting hit by it. So it's a great little visualization tool. This purple circle on the center, if you grab the handles for that and adjust them, that's going to adjust your, your, your lights fall off um, very quick and useful. And then the outside one actually adjusts your beam angle. Um, so th that's the most comprehensive. You have the most controls over that. And I actually, I should show you the light manager real quick as well. Um, if you go to the lighting workspace, you're gonna find a light manager open at the bottom here. So this light manager is basically just a quick way to, to look through all your different lights. You have access to them, the co their colors, their power, uh, radius, as you change uh, different parameters inside the real-time view, you're gonna see those reflected out here. So another useful tool, uh, speeds up your, your your lighting workflows, makes it a lot easier to, to get a hold of those uh, different parameters without having to jump between different uh, panels and whatnot. I like to work from the default uh, just because that's what I'm accustomed to at this point. But let's see what's going on here. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's, that's our uh, physical lights and our light gizmos, super useful, uh, makes physical lighting your scenes significantly easier. Uh, it's a tool that I've been using a lot as of late, and I really, I really enjoy using. All right, so let's go to Move Tool and Solo Move next. Oh, and just a, a quick plug to our real cloth. I actually made this Satoshi style grill using um, real cloth as well to create a metal mesh. So there's a little application uh, of where where real cloth and meshes could kind of coincide. So that's that's how I made that mesh right there. Um, and but in this case, we're going to talk about uh, move tool improvements and using solo mode. So uh, let's see here. I'm going to start by opening up solo mode with just a tire over here. So if you right click or use the hotkey S, you can open up solo mode on a specific part or parts. Uh, if you select multiple parts, it'll isolate those parts and you can edit all of them at the same time. Uh, solo mode is a great tool for working quickly. It, it doesn't interfere with existing workflow. So if you have something that you prefer uh, doing, you can still use it. Uh, this is something that's been useful for me just because I, I prefer using the solo mode workflow. Um, again, if you hit the hotkey S, that should pull you out. Um, and that's, that's another way to, to work with solo mode. If I go in here, I can select multiple parts, as I mentioned. I'll just select two random parts. And then we'll go to solo mode on those as well. And you can see that those parts are now isolated together because I want to work on both of those at the same time. Uh, and then this takes us into the move tool. So if I wanted to move my selection, so now same same move tool icon, the actual physical tool itself, but the the, the actual movements between uh, your cursor and the part are significantly improved, even at steep camera angles. So like in this case, I'm just gonna grab that and I'm gonna pull it back and pull it forward. In previous versions, I would have had to take multiple attempts at pulling it and pushing it to get it to do that exact same thing. So huge improvement in, in its interface and how it works. Uh, I think that's great, especially when you're trying not to zoom in and out of your scene and just make things a little bit faster. Our move tool, we have our scale, our translate and our rotate icons instead of the check boxes. And now you have your position and advanced accordions as well. Uh, all the existing settings in the previous move tool are now under advanced, but you also have that position settings under the position accordion, which you can see over here as well. And if I make any adjustments here, you'll see it here. If I make any adjustments there, you'll see it here. Very useful. Um, it's, a, it's a nice little improvement for speeding up workflows. So that's it for solo mode and, and the move tool. Uh, very straightforward, easy to use. I think it's going to help speed up everybody's workflows just a bit there. So definitely dive into that and, and play around with it. And the last thing I wanted to talk to you before or, uh, turning it over to Brooke for our animation demo is the flip normals tool. So this is a Bosch drill from our cloud library. If you guys have not been using the cloud library, you can find it down here. It's a uh, great tool. I 
let me see if we can load it up here for you guys to see uh, all kinds of, of stuff being uploaded regularly. Uh, we have a model library, which is where this Bosch hammer came from. And we have all kinds of models for you to populate your scenes or practice lighting, practice rendering, whatever you want. They're all there for you. Uh, also a slew of different materials and environments, super useful tool. But this Bosch hammer can be found under the model section if you'd like to play around with it. And we're going to be uh, messing with the normals on this part over here. So if I click on that and I go to tools in the ribbon and I open up our flip normals tool, oh, let's make sure this is selected. There we go. All right, so our flip normals tool. Now you can see that part inside of a fairly familiar looking window. If you've done any UV unwrapping um, or, or you know, splitting faces, it's is a, a fairly familiar window. Um, so down here we have a show face normals. I like to use that just because it gives me a visual representation using these little hairs of where my normals are actually pointing. Um, and so what you're seeing here, anywhere that's gray, the normals are facing outward, while red areas are showing my normals facing inward. And we don't want that. We want all our normals facing the camera, right? Um, you're kind of seeing it going on in the Bosch hammer as well, but that's because there's a different uh, geometry that's actually making that up. So if you see red there, don't worry about it because you're actually seeing the inside of the part. But for the rest of the part, we want to fix these normal issues. So you can do this two ways. You can either select the face that you'd like to flip that normal. These items will no longer be grayed out. You can either deselect or you can flip normals. And when you flip your normals, your area that's been flipped should automatically uh, change to white or uh, to, to the gray color that exists with the rest of them. If you don't want to select individual parts, you can hit the auto align normals at the top and it should take care of all your normals throughout your entire model. Your logo is a separate piece of geometry, so you're actually seeing inside of the part. But other than that, everything else is got the correct normals now. And then when you're done, you can hit apply, but a quick little thing, you have your display height. Um, usually I just work with the display height at, uh, at one, it's, it gets the point of cross, but if you really wanted to get crazy, you can, you know, pull this all the way up to 10 and, and just have your normals blasting everywhere. But a, a very useful tool, especially if you're having issues with mapping different types of materials or textures. All right, and uh, with that said, let me uh, pass this over to Brooke and she can run you through the animation overhaul. Well, cool. thanks, Kareem. I'm just gonna get my screen up here. All right, cool. Hi, everybody. My name is Brooke Harrington. I am one of the creative specialists here at Luxion. And today I'm excited to give you guys a look at some of the awesome new animation features in Keyshot 10. We're gonna start with um, keyframe animation, which I have set up here in this scene. This is a really, really cool addition to Keyshot. You're gonna be able to create way more complex animations much, much faster. So um, with keyframes, essentially what you're able to do is capture your geometry's position with these sequences of keyframes along the timeline. So you can see in this um, scene here, I actually have several keyframe animations all set up individually applied to each one of these cubes that you can see in my scene. And if we look towards this folder here, which contains the three keyframe animations applied to these really big cubes right here, um, and I select on one of these, you can see that the object's path is represented in the real-time view by this yellow line. Um, and really this animation is only comprised of three different keyframes, so it's relatively simple. Um, the very first keyframe starting here at the start position with these cubes, um, you know, at this resting position, then the second keyframe just below one second, I um, mean, you can see the movement that's occurring there. And then lastly, this third keyframe over here at the four second mark. And just because of the way that I've spaced these out along the timeline, I can get this sort of like explosion of movement that then sort of tapers out into like a slow motion effect. So it's a really cool um, technique. And, you know, otherwise 
an animation like this truthfully would take tons and tons of translation and rotation animations, but um, with keyframes, it's really easy. And that's, that's largely because you're able to modify both the translation and rotation values um, simultaneously. So I actually also have a little cube in here that does not have a keyframe animation applied, but I will add one to it just to show you guys how easy this is. So we're just gonna add keyframe. And that very first keyframe that gets added um, is gonna capture the current position of your geometry in the real time view. And let's open this up. So I'm just gonna shift this first keyframe to the beginning and that starting position is fine because that's where all these other cubes are starting from. Um, I'll simply just move my playback bar in line with the rest of the keyframes and choose this add keyframe icon. That is going to launch the move tool for you, um, where then at this point, you can just modify your geometry's position. In this scene, these cubes are kind of going, kind of going a little crazy all over the place. Um, you can also go into the position accordion here and use these translation rotation values for some really precise adjustments. So that's actually a really cool um, improvement here in the move tool that then plays into the, the keyframe animation. But so that looks good, and I'm just going to drag my timeline, my playback bar again across the timeline to that four second mark and add in my last keyframe, in which again, we'll just shift it just a little bit here um, and give it some rotation. Um, I will say that with a keyframe animation, it's really beneficial to think about sort of like the natural progression of motion for your object um, with sort of like, you know, real world forces that might act upon it. Understanding that is really what's going to set it apart from um, other animations in creating a really realistic visual. Um, but you can see here how easy that was just to get that guy set up and he's following that yellow path. So it's fairly simple. There is a second workflow that you can use with keyframes that actually makes it even faster and that is record mode. So if I enable record mode here, um, basically what happens when that's, when that's active is any changes to the position of your geometry will automatically trigger the creation of a keyframe. So for example, if I'm working with the same cube again, and I realize that I want a uh, keyframe added at the five second mark, instead of adding the keyframe with record mode, I can just, I can just simply keep dragging my uh, cube and it will automatically trigger that keyframe. So this is a, a really awesome workflow technique if you're making super long keyframe animations um, because it definitely saves you that extra click of having to you know, add a keyframe there. But overall, I'm a huge fan of keyframe animation. I think this is definitely worth, worth checking out. Um, it's a, I think it's a total game changer for animation in Keyshot and promise you it'll make your life easier with uh, these more complex animation types. Um, all right, so let's switch over to our environment rotation animation here. We have this scene here with a can of render juice and um, I'll press play on there with also a custom environment that I've set up. So what's happening here with the environment rotation animation is we're actually animating this rotation parameter from the environment settings. It's a really nice feature because you can use it with um, any HDRI, maybe one you've grabbed from the Keyshot Cloud or one that you've created yourself. Overall, it does a really great job at just casting these cool shadows and getting those highlights bouncing across your model. So I'm sure you can imagine um, all the possibilities with the, this animation feature. And if we look towards the um, animation properties panel, you'll see that there are two different editing modes here. There's um, simple and advanced and simple mode is a fantastic place to start. You're just gonna set your start and end angle. It is super straightforward and easy and it'll really, really get you going quickly with this animation type. Um, but I do encourage all of you to check out advanced because that's where you're really gonna be able to get creative with this animation feature. Um, in the advanced mode, you're presented with this curve editor. Um, and I promise you it's, it's fairly straightforward to use. All we're doing is setting our keys here um, across the y-axis with our degrees of rotation represented. So right now, actually, this start key and end key are the same um, values that we saw in simple mode. The only difference is the curve, the way that the path or the path that the environment is taking 
um, between those two points. Um, so I was able to come in and drag out these handles to give it, you know, a nice gentle slope. Um, but you can also add in keys like I did here and drag that out, you know, wherever you'd like it to be. And that will that will really change the direction of the animation. Let's see what that looks like. Well, it, it's interesting. <laughs> um, it does, it'll take a little bit of uh, working here to, to get that, you know, where you want it. But overall, it is a, uh, it provides a lot more flexibility. I think it's a, a really great feature to get familiar with because you do have more control here. So I'm a big fan of the environment rotation animation um, just because I do think it has so much potential for showcasing your model. And then if you are a fan of that one, you'll also be a fan of the um, envi or the uh, sun and sky day arc animation feature, which I have set up in this scene here. Um, this is just a low poly model of a scene, but I think it does a pretty cool job of showing like how dramatic these shadows can really get. I mean, they're pretty cool. And what's happening here is we're actually animating the sun uh, the sun's path across the environment underneath the sun and sky background option. And there, there is a lot of flexibility with this animation type, um, meaning that any changes you make here in the HDR editor, they will be represented in your animation. So for example, you can change the location, um, the date. If you have uh, if you have shadows like this, you can increase the sun size. It'll you know soften those, decrease it, get really sharp shadows. So it's it's a pretty flexible. Um, animation type also because you are presented again with something fairly similar to the environment rotation um, animation within the properties panel you have simple and advanced editing modes um, in the simple mode like environment it's a really great place to start you're just going to set your desired date and then enter in that start and end time um, one cool little tip here for example if you are if you've shifted this um, but you realize you want to create a sunrise to sunset, you can just go ahead and, and click that icon and that start time will adjust for that selected date. Um, again, advanced mode is where you can get a little bit more creative. It's gonna look familiar, um, similar to the environment rotation animation. Curve editor, the difference um, is in the Y axis. Along here, we have our hours in a day. So this is going from zero to 24 hours. Um, but the concept is still the same. I mean, you can go in and edit that curve, uh, add in a key, you know, add in several keys, whatever you'd like and, and adjust all of this. And that'll give you um, a really different effect there. So again, obviously you have more control here um, and things can get pretty interesting with the way the sun is traveling across your animation. Um, but yeah, I think this animation is a really great one to use if you're looking for those super dramatic shifts in lighting, or maybe you need to capture um, a realistic sunrise to sunset, you know, something like that is definitely achievable with this animation type. Cool. And then last, I'm going to switch back to actually the um, render juice can just to quickly go over our last animation feature, and that is the twist camera animation, and which can be found here. So we're going to right click. This is you know, a pretty simple animation type, but I think it does a really great job of sort of rounding out this list of camera animations that we have here. So just go ahead and drop that one in and drag it to the beginning. You can already see kind of what's happening here. We're basically animating just this twist parameter, which you can find in the camera um, settings here. And truthfully, all you have to do is just add in your degrees of rotation, whatever that might be. Maybe it's 90, maybe it's 360. Um, we'll go ahead and play that. Yeah, it's a fairly straightforward, really easy to use animation type, but I think, you know, paired with something else or even on its own, you know, it really has the potential to bring an animation to the next level. So that wraps up sort of my overview of the animation features in 10. Um, I do wanna just say that we have some really in-depth quick tips and tutorials on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you have any questions, we can go ahead and take those in the Q&A, but also go ahead and check out those, that video content. Um, I think it'll really, it's really in-depth and really help you guys out. So with that being said, I'm gonna pass it to Kareem so you can go in detail about some of that and, and um, take over with the Q&A. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, let me just get my screen up here. All right. All right. Well, thanks for sticking with us, everyone. And on that note, let's open it up for some Q&A and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. All right. Thank you guys so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we answered a number of questions in the Q&A, but I'll grab a couple here. One person's asking um, that when they're rendering, they're noticing it's not using uh, the full power of the GPU or the CPU. Uh, can you just show them the drop down real quick for how to uh, make sure you're on the maximum number um, for um, usage? Sure. Let me uh, let's jump in here. This is probably a fairly easy scene to set to GPU. All right. So I am switched over to GPU or in the process of doing so. Um, right, right where your CPU usage was, if you have GPU uh, enabled, you're going to have your GPU usage percentage up here. So uh, if you want to get to 100% or if you don't want to get to 100%, this is where you're going to be able to uh, change things around. Um, I'm not going to get too crazy here because I don't want my computer to freeze up. But yeah, that's that's where you're going to be able to change it. Same way as uh, GPU or CPU. So definitely take a look there. Uh, one question for you, Brooke. Is there a way to make the model aligned to a compass that matches the environment sun shadow simulator? So I guess what they're asking there is making sure your model is pointing to due north, for example. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can open my scene to demonstrate that. It might be worth just checking out one of our quick tips that uh, talks about centering your model. And from there, you can use your um, camera to adjust that and set that up. Also checking out the um, the rotation setting that you have for your actual sun and sky day arc. You can go in and, and rotate that so that it aligns with your model. As for an actual compass sort of alignment, um, that is something I can look into and let you know about. Don't have the answer quite off the top of my head in regards to that compass. Okay. Uh, someone's asking, and is there a good way to add a camera path animation with an environment so the model doesn't look like it's just sliding around? I'm not 100% do, do you understand the question? I'm a little unclear on exactly what they're envisioning there. Right. Um, if, if I'm looking at the same question, it is possible to stack, you know, an environment with a path or with any other type of uh animation so you can put those two together and um if that's if that answers the question you can stack them together okay and that's another question as well someone's asking kind of overlaying the animations um someone else is asking if there's any colliding features between objects so any kind of physics uh there's not currently any physics in uh key shot 10 um but it's certainly something that has been a request in the past and something that we are uh investigating um what about allowing the angle tri-tip tab to stay open in material graph texture nodes? Uh, I think that's a material graph node question. Uh, there aren't any changes in the material graph for Keyshot 10, but certainly something I can look, uh, look into. Um, for real cloth, how do you create custom cloth patterns then? Um, well, you are limited by um, basically the warp and the weft that's inside of there um, and and dictating that um, in terms of the size. So I think if you're kind of tr trying to create a true custom cloth pattern, like import one, you would not be able to do that. You have to work within um, the existing real cloth setup. Uh, will older materials libraries created with Keyshot 8 and 9 work with 10? Yes, they will. Um, Great improvements, uh, a lot of positive feedback. I'm just going through here real quick. Uh, can Keyshot render volumes like smoke and explosions? Uh, yes, you can import those into Keyshot um, and, and do that with, um, we add that with Keyshot nine volumetrics. Um, should I see anything? Uh, is it, is it po oh, uh, for the keyframe animation, they're asking uh, to have um, uh, how you control the line of animation with uh, Bezier curves. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to kind of talk about that real quick, about sort of how you control the animation, the actual flow of the keyframe animation. Uh, you mean like actually manipulate the path? Correct, yeah. Sure, I can, I'll switch the screen and just go back to that scene.
All right, if you can see, yeah, it's super easy to manipulate the path. I mean, if you go back, we're looking at that same cube here. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, if you just highlight that keyframe and that'll open an editing mode in which you can go back in and uh, shift to sort of manipulate that curve. It's quite flexible, you know, the editing portion of it. Great, thank you. Well, we're at the top of the hour here. We have a couple of questions that we can kind of answer offline since they're sort of specific to um, the actual use case of the user. Um, but I don't know if you want to bring up real quick, Kareem, uh, the final screen sort of showing just uh, which we kind of start off with of, of what people can um, follow up with. Again, we're so this is you know great webinar to kind of have an overview of everything we have in there. Uh, each of the features are also shown in, in either quick tips or tutorials. So please join our YouTube um, page. We're updating that uh, very frequently uh, with new content. So definitely if you enjoyed the work of Kareem and Brooke today, uh, follow along for that throughout the Keyshot 10 uh, life cycle and we'll continue to put great content on there. Um, if you have questions and kind of want to talk to other users, uh, you can visit our forum, which is a great resource. And then please uh, post your renders on our Instagram page. We love to see all the great things that people do with Keyshot. So definitely feel free to post that on um, Instagram and tag us. Um, and then also for people who kind of want the, the quick tips pushed via, via Facebook or Twitter, uh, follow along there and you can get all the great content. Um, if you have questions, some people kind of had support related questions here with regard to um, either license upgrades or things of that nature. Um, you can follow up with sales directly. We will be having uh, our annual sale. So for folks who are looking to get the Cyber Monday discount, uh, that will be uh, happening this year. Um, if you have questions for support, um, you can please follow our support at Luxion.com. Uh, and then, yeah, if you have specific questions for uh, Kareem with the team here, um, you can uh, hit Kareem uh, at his address. And please uh, follow us along. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Brooke and Kareem, for the wonderful presentations. And we'll be seeing everyone out there on social media.